we're going to talk about event counters, timers, and the real-time clock. In particular, um, there are a bunch of different uh, topics. Now, one thing that I'm not going to cover today, which this is when we were doing the, uh, uh, the book, didn't know if we should do interrupts first and the, uh, the specifics for interrupts, because we've kind of mentioned interrupts as we've gone along. But we decided to just talk about timers. And the other thing associated with timers is what's called a, uh, um, a uh, oh, God. all of a sudden I can't get this, pulse width modulation uh, signal that is very good at uh, driving servos and uh, motors. So we're going to look at that as well. So as you can imagine, a timer is a counter which counts clock pulses, but you could also provide a different type of signal that is used by other parts of your circuit. So an 8-bit timer with a 10 megahertz clock can measure a maximum of oh, only 25.5 microseconds. That's not a lot of time, is it? So one of the tricks that we also do is we, we uh, daisy chain some of these uh, timers together. But another thing we also take a look at is being able to take a, a longer or a, a slower clock than just the P clock. And we're going to look at that in our slides later. So as an example, we can have a prescaler. We can have something that says, well, rather than taking our P clock, what we'll do is we'll take the P clock divided by 2, or the P clock divided by 8, or by 32, or by 64, or by uh, uh, 1024, or by 81. 82. So in other words, taking a slower P clock and then counting up time based on that. So we're going to look at some examples uh, later uh, with doing that. All right. So for the uh, RX63N, there's actually two 8-bit uh, channels that you can uh, put right next to each other to make a little bit wider. So you can cascade these to form a 16-bit uh, a counter. And there are also two units of that which uh, allow you to have then a total of um, uh, six timers altogether. We'll look, look at how you do that in a moment. Now, not only can you use a timer to add things up, but you can also use it to uh, uh, decrement down or to make comparisons later. And we'll have uh, examples of how you can preset and count up to a particular number and then start all over again. Maybe I should ask right now, how many of you have had experience with timers? Raise your hand. Hi, 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 hi. So I can, oh, so this is kind of like a recap for almost all of you. Is that right? Uh, did you do it with non-RX63N devices? All right, who's done it with an RX63N device? All right, so this will be new for some of you, and for others of you, um, it will uh, it'll be just a recap. So, oh, by the way, we could also do what, what I called a pulse width uh, output operation. So hopefully, you all have had analysis of uh, a duty cycle and, um, and clocks so that you know um, what a frequency, what a period, and what a duty cycle is, right? So if I were to give you a quiz right now, everybody would get it? Who has not had an analysis of duty cycle and periods and, uh, and frequency? All right, that should have been covered in 2181. Shame on your Professor, ooh, did I say that on tape? All right. <laughs> so uh, let me do a quick little assessment of that. This is a nice question. In fact, uh, oops. So we're going to have uh, one thing. We're going to have, if you have a waveform, 
an analysis of the waveform is as such. If you're looking at the time that a particular square wave is uh, is available and you count from, for example, the rising edge to the next rising edge, and that will have a certain time t. So t is going to be equal to the period of your wave. Let's take, for example, this is uh, 100 nanoseconds. You could find out what the frequency of your of your waveform is by looking at 1 over the time. So in this case, what is the frequency of our signal right here? Okay, so it's going to be obviously 1 over um, 1 over 10 nanoseconds. So this turns out to be 10 megahertz. So that is, uh, now we're looking at frequency. Now the last thing to think about is that over this entire time of one of these waveforms, there's going to be a certain amount of time that it is uh, logical one. And a certain amount of time that it is going to be logical zero. And so your duty cycle is, is basically going to be the percentage of time that it is logical 1. So in this case, if it turns out that this is 50 nanoseconds and this is 50 nanoseconds, so it's going to turn out to be 50% which is literally 50 nanoseconds over 100 nanoseconds times 100 because you're looking at a percent. Now if I had a signal that turned out that this was 20 nanoseconds and this is 80 nanoseconds, It turns out that my duty cycle is 20% because it's only up 20% of the time. This is an easy example. All right. Now, reason this is important is because when you're talking about certain types of devices like motors, uh, servo motors, DC motors, whatever, you can actually provide a signal that provides energy to run that motor for 20% of the time and then no energy by 80% of time. And what that may do for you is it will allow your motor to run at a lower speed if it's a DC motor. If it's a servo, then this is actually a signal to be able to identify to the servo motor that it's to move to a certain position. And I really get into servos and such in, uh, in my uh, uh, advanced embedded systems class and also in uh, robotics. All right, everybody familiar with this now? Go back up here. And so in this case, as I showed here, if my period is 2 milliseconds, that's not really uh, a, a, a clock that you would have a microcontroller at, would it? It might be something that would control, for example, a servo. This would probably be an appropriate signal for a servo. And if my duty cycle is going to be 1.75 uh, milliseconds out of the 2 milliseconds, then it's an 87.5% duty cycle. By the way, what's the, uh, what's the frequency on this? 
should be able to tell just like that. 500 hertz, correct. Now the reason why you might want to do this is because we have, um, and I'll show examples of this in our, uh, in our timers, you'll have uh, the opportunity to set two variables at a particular um, value and what you will do is you will count up until a particular uh, value and then restart counting at zero and then restart counting at zero but these two, uh, these two registers will allow you to identify how long your duty cycle is going to be so in this case your uh, um, by setting the T core B register would identify how much time it's going to be for um, for the logical one and then the uh, T core A would identify how low or how long it's going to be at a logical zero and this is uh, as I said there are four different uh, outputs that you can control these and you know as I said you're hooking these up to external motors uh, whether they be um, servos or, or DC's so you can directly set up one of the output pins to uh, give you this uh, duty cycle so let's look at a little bit more detail about our uh, our registers so when we take a look at our, our um, registers specifically our 8-bit registers we're going to have uh, in this case uh, timer 0 and timer 1 can be separate or you can cascade these together as I mentioned earlier you can also do the same for T uh, TMR2 and TMR3 I had mentioned earlier that sometimes you want to work with a slower clock and so you have the timer counter control register TCCR that you can use for the prescaler for the clock source and this is on the next page let's go to the uh, the uh, um, uh, what do you call that the uh, hardware manual and look that up and in fact, I think I'm going to stop and have you do a little exercise uh, for uh, setting up the registers. It's not going to be that soon yet, Pranay, so hold on. So in our hardware manual, we're going to be looking specifically for timers and so let's uh, see where that shows up 16-bit pulse unit multifunction timer pulse unit where's just my general 8-bit timers here we go as you can clearly see from this page pretty much what I've described to you already 8 bits, 2 channels, 2 units you can do a 8 bit mode, 16 bit mode um, compare match A, compare match B overflow, we'll look at some uh, instances of how these are all implemented Ooh, page down on the wrong thing now these should actually be about the same thing, yeah Understanding how all of our hardware works, it's nice to be able to look at um, where the inputs, the control inputs are, are going to be running. So in this case, you notice that uh, we have our, our T count register associated with our timer 0 and timer 1. 
Remember, there's a equivalent uh, uh, two and three. Is that the next slide? Yeah. The next slide is an equivalent two and three. And you can remember I mentioned the T core A and the T core B for using it for um, for pulse width modulation. That is used in conjunction with the uh, the T counts comparators as well. So T core A and T core B are uh, are used, and you could also uh, uh, tie these together as a 16-bit uh, number as well. And then our inputs are going to be P clock, P clock divided by 2, 8, 32, etc. Let's look at our, uh, oh, in the uh, T core A and T core uh, B registers as well. Timer control register. This is what I, uh, one of the ones I wanted to show you. Ah. First of all, I was looking at this one. Timer con counter control register. Uh, C table uh, 27.5, which is uh, next page, which allows you to identify, um, for example, using the, uh, the frequency dividing clock of 2, 8, 32, 64, uh, 1024, and 8192. And that's by setting the different types of uh, bits here of both CCS as well as CKS. So, for example, if I wanted to uh, set this at uh, uh, frequency dividing clock of uh, P clock divided by 32, what would I be uh, uh, setting this at? So, 0, 1. 0, 1, 1. The next thing I had in the slides was the control register itself. And remember how we've mentioned with uh, serial ports that uh, you can identify different types of interrupts uh, based on what the, the uh, RS-232 does. So, for example, when it, or I'm sorry, UART in general, when it receives a byte, then you can get interrupted. When you have successfully sent a byte, you could be interrupted. We'll work on the, uh, the next class will be uh, more detail about the interrupts themselves. But in this case, you can, you can actually set the, uh, the overflow interrupt, meaning you've counted up to a certain number and at that point, you can uh, uh, turn around and, and um, you can actually get interrupted. And then there's also uh, an example of match. I think I want to go through an example in the slides first. Heck. Um, I don't want to do this one yet. Wow, don't I have examples in this? Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to go to the, uh, the, the book for the examples in this. So, when you're cascading timers together, and uh, we, we kind of alluded to this, if you are using um, if you are using the 16-bit uh, mode, and you're using the regular P clock, the most that you can represent, and this is um, associated with a uh, 24 megahertz peripheral clock. What does that sound like? 
Is, is that what we're uh, is that what we're using on our board, or does our board have a 48? All right. So this is half of our half of our board that we're using, and we're using the 64 clock divisions. And since we have 16 bits, we're using up to 65, 535. So if you look at this with the clock, 64 clock divisions, we could have a maximum of uh, 174.78 milliseconds. That's from the table here. So if we have this, uh, we're running directly with the P clock flat out, um, it would be 2.73 milliseconds. If we're using the, uh, uh, the peripheral clock uh, divided by 8196, again at 24 megahertz for our, our P clock, we can count up to 22 seconds. Now, if I'm running with a P clock of 48 megahertz, what is my time between um, overflow in the 16-bit mode. Should be quick. Half of that. So 11 point, uh, roughly a 185, right? Now, is everybody kind of? I'm kind of glossing over this, and I really haven't haven't gone into detail about what actually happens with a count. Is everybody familiar with that? Yes, no? No, oh, okay. So maybe this would uh, uh, be best to show a picture before I go into any more detail. I, and again, I'm not sure how much of this has been covered in your, your previous uh, education. I was told that this was covered in an earlier uh, undergraduate class, 3183. Is this not been done? No. Peripheral clocks and timers? No. no? Oh my gosh. Okay. Shame on them. I, man, I just recorded that again, didn't I? Okay. So I guess, have I been losing a lot of people in this, uh, in this class so far? Because I've whipped through this stuff really fast. Have I lost anybody? Yes, no? Okay, I've got yeses and nos. I have a timer. Here is my timer. What I'm doing is I'm feeding to this timer a clock. And this is a special device that for every rising edge of the clock, I will increment by one whatever the contents of this timer is. I mean, that's simply what it is. So if I have uh, one, two, three, by the way, it doesn't always have to be a clock. It could be an input pin that counts events of something going on, like pushing a button or something like that. All right? So every time it sees a rising edge, it'll increment this. So if this is what it sees, what's going to be, and it starts at zero, what's going to be the value of this after this runs? Yeah. Zero, 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 one, one, right? Now, if this is really a clock, so if my input is a, uh, let's go with a 10 megahertz clock. Again, this is 8 bits, right? How many clock cycles will it take to fill this up to all ones? All right, so 255 oops, clocks fills to 1111 256 resets overflow 
to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So what happens is that when it goes to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, then I'll actually get an output pulse from this timer. Now this output pulse could do one of two things. It could, uh, it could go, it could do actually to many things. It could go to a pin, an output pin of the entire unit. It could go to um, another timer. At the same time, it could also generate an interrupt. Now, how much time has elapsed for these 256 clock cycles? Well, my time is going to be equal to 256 clocks over 10,000 or 10 million. Um, and what is, what is uh, 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 our hertz? So basically clocks per second. So if we do the math, I'm going to pull up my uh, handy dandy calculator. Ooh, wish I got to make sure to turn off the, uh, the ringer so I don't um, have to pay you donuts. Two. All right. So that's, is that right? Yep. 25.6 milliseconds. Ah, uh, microseconds. So that means if I'm running with uh, 10 megahertz, you know, that, that works out really nice, right? So let's set this up. I'm going to put two of these side by side. So this really means that I'm going to count up to what? We said 65, 535, and then it's going to roll over to zero. So how many clocks is it? 536? If I'm going to uh, do two of these together, and let's say I'm running with my 48 megahertz P clock, how much time is this? I kind of had it on the slide earlier, right? But I'm going to let you figure this out. I'll let you all figure it out. Just hold on. Don't say anything. One point three five milliseconds. Actually, that works out pretty good, right? Now, there's another thing which I mentioned you could do, and that is instead of running with your uh, instead of running with your P clock, you could run with your uh, uh, P clock divided by something. So let's divide it by uh, um, 8192. Now, so how long? 
Oh, you kind of remember that from the earlier one, right? <laughs> or actually, you could take this number that you have and multiply by 8192, right? And you said 11 point what? So now, the other thing that I mentioned is that at some point in time, you can have, and I'm going to draw these together, you know, 16 bits is kind of, you know, I, I don't want to do each one of them individually, so we'll just say, yeah, that's 16 bits. So if I want to actually count up to an exact number, so what I would do is I would preload this. I would preload a counter, and it would do a comparison. Now, you know, it could count up, it could count down, but what would I want to preload this to? So I would, so I would basically generate, or I would, uh, I would count. exactly 1.0000000 seconds using this 16 bit space what would i need to set my p clock to divided by n and then what would my value be to be able to count up to 1 second, assuming that my P clock is equal to 48 megahertz. So I've given you the basics. So you're going to count up from zero to some number that will give you exactly one second. You're running at 48 megahertz. Although what is your N going to be and what is your M going to be? Now, do the idiot trick, like, like I often do. Um, your P clock alone, 48, uh, 48 megahertz, will give you 1.365 milliseconds. So the answer is, is it going to be P clock and N is equal to 1? No, it's going to be something more. However, when you say P clock divided by 8192, it's 11.184 seconds. So is it going to be 8192? It may be 8192 if you're not adding up all the bits, right? But it's usually really good to make this number, this 16-bit number, as big as possible. So there's actually several options. There will be a presetting when P clock is 8182. There will be a presetting when the P clock is, what's the next lower? 1024. There will be another setting when it's the next number, etc. So using the little helpful hints uh, that we showed right here as an idea, what would you set it at? Go to it. All right, uh, we're back. Somebody gave me this recommendation. Oh, you only did one of them, though. This is with uh, 1024. So wouldn't it work with, uh, wouldn't it work with 892 uh, as well? No. No? Oh, it wouldn't be exact. You'll have a decimal, right? Ah, so that's a good point to make. So uh, um, in this case, uh, we like this. What did the uh, person write? I'm going to have to copy this on the notes so that, 
because otherwise I have to take your entire spiral ring binder and that would just be bad, right? So we're going to have some, um, some, well, let's look at the formula back here. So I had uh, 1 over the uh, uh, P clock divided by N clock divisions. You can't see what I'm writing, but I want to look at this before. Um, over 1 times M. All right, you agree with that? So it turns out that our clock is uh, 1 over 48 million. We could set our N, the, uh, the clock divisions. We're going to do both. We're going to do 8192. And uh, um, this means that our, um, our M over here So let's see, this is going to be M counts. Divided by 8192. And this is equal to, can you, anybody? 5.8.2. Now, then, if we do this with uh, M counts is equal to 48,000 million, sorry, uh, divided by 1024, uh, we got uh, 46,875. So, the, as I said, the obvious thing is to note since we're setting a, an integer, obviously it's good to not have a, uh, um, not to have a decimal. Now, let's put it this way. Is this 1024? Is this, uh, you know, the, the fact that this number is very big, is that any different than this number being very, very relatively small? If this turned out to be 0 .000, and this was, you know, 0 .000 for whatever problem we're talking about, it wouldn't make any difference which one you chose because the, uh, um, the scalar here uh, would help you. And keep in mind, is it the software that's doing all of this counting of timer ticks? No, it's actually a piece of hardware. It's a piece of hardware of the peripheral that's doing all that work. So you don't have to worry about it. And that works out well because you can just let the hardware do the counting. You let the hardware generate the pulse width modulated signal. You let the hardware do all of that work. And you just have to worry about uh, setting it up and letting it run. Now, why would you want something that would happen once every one second, for example? Have I given the mobile phone example in this class? Did I talk about this? If you have, uh, for example, a CDMA phone, you need to wake up every 1.024 seconds. The phone needs to listen to the base station. When it hears the base station, the agreed to base station, because it's not looking for another one, it listens to it, says, do you have a call for me? And if there's no call, do you have a text or anything else for me? If not, it goes back to sleep. And uh, uh, there are other types of uh, applications, uh, Google, uh, Apple, they have all sorts of, if you are using push notification, that would be the time that uh, that information would be sent to you as well. But again, wake up. Do I hear the base station? Yes. Base station 
that I've been assigned to work with. Do you have anything for me? No? Go back to sleep. Save your battery life. Now, you know, in a phone, it may wake up after it's 1.024 seconds. It may say, base station, you got something for me? I can't hear the base station. All right, let me lie. All right, base stations that are within earshot, I can't hear anybody. And then you might uh, get some notification from another base station. Then your information is handed off. That new base station is where you're going to receive calls and everything else. But the timer would be the one thing that would wake up the phone, turn on the radio, listen to the base station. Now, of course, you've got other devices right now. My, uh, my phone, I'm waving it around, and it's still asleep. There's no screen on. Nothing is going on because I haven't given it the special button press to wake it up. Well, as opposed to this thing, have I told you, showed you how this works? No? So this is, this is, my, uh, um, this is my Apple Watch, so. <laughs> so here's my Apple Watch, right? Pardon me? Oh, you're right. Ooh, ah. Uh, but what, what is this? I can't even see anything on it. doesn't even show me what the time is, right? However, if I bring it up to my face to read, yeah, let's see if it works again. It works a lot better when, uh, there we go. See it's on? So I brought it up to my face to read, and it's going to read for a little bit, and then time's out. That's another application of the timer. So it's going to show, um, well, the turning of the watch on is based on, and this is the neat thing about whoever designed this thing. This looks better when I uh, roll up my sleeve, right? What is it trying to do? It's trying to save uh, energy, right? I'm obviously not looking at it, right? But when I bring it up to my face, it turns it on. All right, so that's one aspect of saving power. But what does it also do? It turns it off after five seconds. So that's another use of a timer in an embedded system where we would want it to maybe run just for five seconds and then turn off. Because you don't have to have a timer keep it on running all the time. You could just have it count up to five seconds and then turn off. Or, you know, not use that five second timer anymore. But the other neat thing about this is, nope, I kind of brought it up, but it's not in the right orientation. So actually, I specified what wrist this would be on, so it knows the motion of somewhere down here to somewhere up here is being near my face to want to watch, or want to look at the watch. So when we're talking about embedded systems, now we're looking at what, what's probably driving that uh, um, observation of the motion. Excellent. All right, accelerometer, most likely a three-dimensional accelerometer, maybe even inside of it a gyroscope too. Then we have timers that's going to turn on the, uh, the clock, right? And oh, by the way, there is also a, a clock in there too because I'm using it for you know, like any digital watch, you're using it for a timer. Uh, I'm using it for the time of day. I'm using it for a lot of other types of uh, uh, time devices. And so that is another application of timers because it has built into it now a set of timers that will identify probably not every second, but probably every one millisecond. So tell me. What would I set everything to, is another exercise now, what would I set everything to if I wanted one millisecond? So do the computation yourself, see what happens. Because it's going to be a lot different than that one, isn't it? That one might be better, you never know. So one millisecond, figure out what's the best setting. Okie dokie, so... Here's the question then, uh, how many of these scalars and timer presets can I use? Can I use one with 8192? 
Be, uh, what's what would the number be? Five point eight five. Eight five. Well, that doesn't look too good, does it? Um, ten twenty four. Forty-six point eight seven. Forty-six point eight seven. Oh, that sucks. Uh, uh, that's bad. Um, seven five zero point thirty-two. Yeah, basically twice that, right? Twenty-four thousand. So I guess it comes down to which one is preferred. So. Well, here's, here's a question is, what would have been the benefit to use this one right here? Lower energy. Lower energy? There's another one. There's another benefit to using this one, even if it's not exact. One 8-bit counter. But the unfortunate thing is, it's not exact, and if we have a watch, do we want to be exact? Yes. yes. So it, it still turns out that we don't want those two, because especially if we have a watch and a clock, we want to be as precise as possible. Alrighty. I think I showed the picture. The one thing I want to uh, left to talk about is that there is a real-time clock that you can set and then read. Now, the book has all the specifics on how you can set it up and, um, and then go ahead and, and read back later. One thing that might be of interest is, uh, and, and this also has, uh, for example, this has the uh, uh, ones place of seconds and the, uh, the tens place of seconds. So you can actually, this, this device can actually tell you what the real clock is uh, for the particular time, and oh, time, time of day clock. Does it give you anything less than uh, minutes or less than seconds? Oh, it doesn't look like it does. I was thinking that if, uh, if you uh, uh, timed it right, you can use it for the lab that you have uh, currently going on. But apparently, no, it just uh, starts at seconds and goes up to minutes. Oh, you could also set alarms and stuff like that, too. Pretty neat. Setting the real-time clock, blah, blah, blah. I want to set the, uh, um, the pulse units. So I'm going to show code for that. And it doesn't look like I could pull it together quick enough because uh, the, uh, the time is coming. So I'm going to do the following. We'll call it a day. We'll continue this uh, with a little bit on Thursday. See you then. All right, we're going to uh, go over a quick example for timing, and in particular, we're going to look at uh, pulse width modulation. Uh, in your hands, you have uh, a copy of the code. This is in the book, uh, this section of the book, and then, of course, the drawing of the, uh, or the, um, in fact, here, I'll just put this on the screen. The drawing of the actual uh, timer unit, and then the, uh, um, and the actual code for initializing the timer to uh, uh, set it up for 
a particular type of uh, uh, communications. Now, take a look at this. What does the following code do is what I ask. So what is the frequency and what is the duty cycle? Well, we see numbers here. Oops. We see numbers here, but again, what does that mean? And we see uh, different ways to set the TCCR register, the TCR register, and the TCSR register. And of course, we see T Cora uh, A and T Cora B as two different um, things or uh, registers to set. So if we look at this, what I've asked you is all right, this is set for something, this is set for something. What else do we have? TCR, right? By the way, which TCR are we, are we doing? All right, so the, uh, the TCR for which channel? All right. So TCR for this channel. TCCR for that one. Oh, I circled that over there. I shouldn't have circled that over there. I meant to circle this one over here. And then the TCSR. Uh, so what we've done is, is we're going to be using a comparator. We're going to be counting up the count here using this comparator as well. We have two comparators, one for uh, T Cora A and one for uh, a comparator. So literally this count is going to count up from some number to some number. And when it counts up to a certain number, Then it will be uh, it'll be one for a certain amount of time. Our output and our output is going to be which uh, which output? I think we pretty much say what it is. TM zero or TMO zero. So where's my TMO zero? There it is. TMO zero. So that is going to be based on our compare match. We will count up and we will put our signals out here on. TMO0, where 2-0 is identified as the, uh, the duty cycle and the frequency. So just, uh, so I'm going to have you, and I'm going to put up on the screen some, some little uh, concepts. Count source is P clock divided by 8. You're going to have to see what is the CC, CCS bit, what is the CKS bit. What is the CCLR bit? What is the OSA bit? And what is the OSB bit? Now, rather than just uh, trying to uh, uh, just put it up on the screen, I'm going to have you figure this out because you're, you will need to change this entire set of code to allow it to work at a 1 kilohertz square wave with a 50% duty cycle. But at the point right now, I want you to figure out what does the following code do. To help you, I'm going to put on the screen a couple of uh, slides that have specific settings that will help you guide that. For those of you that have PCs, how many of you have PCs in here? All right. I'd like you to at least be in groups of uh, four where one of you has a PC and you could, uh, if you need be, look at the... Uh, um, look at the uh, the book. So, number one, what is this? Number two, how would you modify it to reach that? That is your assignment. We'll be back. When you're ready, we are back. So, class, class. All right, let's take a look at this. Uh, apparently, we have enough people that have uh, problems with this. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so let me go back through this. Number one, the easiest thing to say is what is the frequency? Well, we are, we know that we're going to have. Um, by the way, we wipe this thing out for a second, right? 
this should be an equal sign into that. So we have how many clock divisions, right? We have, uh, this is going to be eight. And we have how many counts? 80, 85. So this turns out to be what? 28.33. By the way, this is 24 megahertz, as we said. So I, I, I well, I'll do the math since uh, I have so many different uh, people saying things. Yeah, I'll clear. 8 times 85 divided by 2400000 zero, 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 equals. Zero two eight three. This is the period, right? And so the frequency is equal to one over the period, and that is equal to. I'll just do this. <laughs> Oops. Do you agree with that? Okay. So in this waveform, I'm going to have from one point to another point, I'm going to have something go up and something go down. And the, uh, the time that that's going to take is 28.3 microseconds. Using the same formula, we're going to figure out, in this case, 20, right? Which is 32 hex, or 32 decimal. So here we'll have uh, <clears throat> 1 over p clock, which is 24 million, times 8, times... 32 over 1, and that is equal to, just somebody solve it for me. How much is it? 10.666 Just to make sure that this is clear. So at some point then, this is... Now, here's one thing. We just know what the period is. So it could be high for 18 point uh, or 9 or 16 point. So, so the point is for the first time, not the entire. Or it could look like this. Again, the entire period is going to be 28.3 microseconds. And this could be 10.666 microseconds, right? So here's the question, which is which? So we look at the code. The code says on the one output at compare match, so when compare match A, compare match A is 55. So it looks like 55 is identifying the period, and when that happens, we output a 1. So it looks like the rising edge is going to be at T, C, and T equal to 0. And then it looks like, uh, well, here, let's put it over here. And then, as we look at this, it says at uh, uh, when you hit 20 hex, then you're going to output a zero. So this is this is at uh, um, as it's counting up from 20 to 55. But here is the where did it go? Which is which? Oh, um, so which is bigger? The, when it's one or when it's zero? 
Zero. When it's zero. Because it's only for 20 ticks or 20 counts. So this is going to be the 10.666 microseconds. And then um, over the remainder, when it's zero, it's counting from 20 up to 55. And that is going to be the, what was it, 17 point six 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 microseconds, right? So that means I have ten point six 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 over twenty eight point three and uh, ten point six 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 twenty eight point three. So it's approximately thirty seven point seven percent or so. I've I've been kind of loosey goosey on the. Uh... All right. Somebody has a doubt, or would that be a question? Question. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, 85 counts is for our x value 55. So uh, our 28.33 seconds should be just the off time, right? Like when it's zero. No. Because what happens is that t count continues the count up. Till 55. So it starts at 0 and it goes up to 55. When it hits 55, and that's based on this setting right here, the timer resets at compare match A. So when A, T core A, hits 55, then it resets. All right? Wow, this is, uh, um, this is all very, uh, uh, well, do you understand it now? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, so quiz number 16. <laughs> Let's do quiz number 16. And quiz number 16 is modify the following code to set up a 1 kilohertz square wave. Be as close to 1 kilohertz. So here's one observation just for fun. Just a concept, right? This number and that number. What's going to be the relationship between these two numbers? Half or half. <laughs> B will be half of A. Now, one of two ways you could do this. Do you have enough in an 8-bit number to count up to one millisecond? Probably not. That's why it's really handy to look at this. Oh, what do you know? If you have TMR0 and TMR1, you can make a 16-bit one, which means that maybe you might have to have some of these that are not only TMR0, but also TMR1. But the thing to keep in mind, as we've mentioned, if you are using two of these counters, you may have to have other settings. For example, you have to identify if you're going to be using 16-bit versus 8-bit, which means that some of these other things may have to be set as well. Go to it.